Our second lecturer is uh, Professor James Heat. Uh, Jim studied chemistry at Baylor University in Texas and did his PhD at Rice University. Uh, he's one of the authors on the very famous paper in science, which I believe uh, all of us have actually read at some point, uh, named and titled C60, Bax Minister Fulleran, uh, a paper published together with uh, Croto, Kerl, and Smalley, who later, of course, were awarded the Nobel Prize for this exciting discovery. Uh, uh, this, I think, Jim, uh, this was a good start, right, for a young PhD student. Uh, Jim then joined IBM for a few years and later moved to UCLA, uh, where he uh, conducted really landmark uh, research on molecular computers. In 2000, he founded the California Nanosystem Institute, and more recently, he first joined Caltech, uh, where he worked until really, I think, last year, uh, when he moved to Seattle to be the president of the Institute for Systems Biology. So Jim uh, splits his time between solid-state quantum physics and material science and systems biology, no doubt, uh, a very unique and impressive combination. So it's a pleasure, Jim, to invite you uh, to present your lecture on molecular view of immuno-oncology. Please, Jim. I want to um, acknowledge my friend Rafi, who turns 80 at some point this year. I think he turns 80 all year long because he's having a birthday party all year long. Um, I've, I've uh, collaborated with Rafi now for most of my scientific career, and I've had the pleasure of coming to Israel, I don't know, a dozen times over the past 20 years. Um, and, you know, I think we have all talked a little bit about the fact that Israel science has, you know, grown into the jewel it is for the, for the country in just 70 years. But that's actually the same time frame that the U.S. science grew. You know, we didn't have much science when Israel started either. And it was really the, um, I think it was the exodus of scientists from Europe during World War II that catalyzed um, both of us. So uh, today, I'm going to talk a lot about um, single cell biology with a focus on proteomics. Uh, I've got some uh, significant collaborators I want to acknowledge. Um, much of the work that I'll talk about has been done with Tony Rebus and David Baltimore, and then um, Bill Goddard, um, as well as uh, Chris Garcia at Stanford um, for some particular projects. And, um, and then some of the technology to talk about came out of my uh, former postdoc, Rong Fan, uh, Sam Ming Pang, uh, Michael Bethune, who worked for the Baltimore lab, Leah Seibmer at the Garcia lab, and then um, Fan and Alphonsus and Wan Jun and, and, and Mo Chow in my lab. OK. so. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that's been evolving in my group for about 10 years, but um, a, a really, you know, wonderful and prescient paper on this topic just came out this past Monday. And so this was, uh, it was a paper that came out of uh, Steve Rosenberg's program at the NIH, and uh, the Rosenberg program has been one of the um, true pioneers in everything in cancer immunotherapy, from IL-2 therapy onto this paper here. And what they did here is that they took a biopsy out of a tumor of a metastatic breast cancer patient. Basically, it's a death. That's an awful, one of the worst things you can have. And out of that biopsy, they analyzed for particular somatic mutations. They calculated out uh, what are called neoantigens, or, or fragments of proteins that contain those mutations. Um, uh, they, they did a computation. They identified T cells in the tumor that seemed to recognize those, those mutations. They expanded the T cells up and put them back into the patient. And, um, and 22 months after that treatment, uh, the patient is, um, is cancer-free. That paper just came out yesterday, or, or, or Monday. And so I think um, many people in Israel may know of, 
Another type of, of adoptive cell therapy, CAR T cells, which uh, Zella Gesher at, at Weizmann was one of the pioneers in that area. The, I think he was the first one to come up with the CAR T cell concept. Um, that kind of therapy has worked well for liquid tumors, but it has not worked well for solid tumors. And breast cancer is a, is a, is a cancer that has really evaded the benefits of immunotherapy, but this really shows that, you know, what, what one can do. But there were some complications with this approach. So the way this, I, I talked a little bit about how this approach, you, you look at these T cells that infiltrate the tumor, you identify which T cells recognize there's a mutated protein, there's a fragment, which is now this is a, a neoantigen that gets presented in an MHC molecule on a tumor cell surface where it's recognized by these T cells. So you identify these T cells that recognize these neoantigens, you expand them in vitro, put them back into the patient. Um, and so this treatment is a proof of principle, but it, it, A, it doesn't scale. It was probably several million dollars to do this one patient. And, and B, you have to do very, very careful patient selection to, to identify people who will respond to this. So um, the project that we've been working on in um, my lab, but also um, with uh, Tony Rebus and David Baltimore. In fact, we have a, a disclosure. We have a company, um, a actually pretty well-funded company to do this, um, Pact Pharma, um, is to try to generalize this approach. And, and, and so I'm going to take this, you know, translational medicine is a topic that um, many universities have debated for a long time, should we get into this. And the debate, you certainly have to have a lot of infrastructure, but the debate is whether this is legitimate science or not. I think that is the silliest debate possible, but it is actually a debate. I think the universities in Boston and Stanford have actually done a significant effort in moving in this direction, but it's, a, it's not, a, it's not a, um, a topic that everyone wants to get into. But what I want to walk through is, as we think about turning this type of a therapy into something that really can work for a lot of patients, what are the real fundamental challenges in chemistry, physics, bioengineering, what have you? that one encounters and has to solve. So if you want to scale this therapy, here's a, a, just a, a picture of a PET scan of a patient with just a, a staggering number of metastases. Um, well, so you would like to do everything out of the blood. And so you want to identify if there are T cells in this patient that recognize antigens in the tumor, neoantigens in the tumor, but um, just take them out of the blood. Um, from the uh, exome, which is just, you can just get that from a little biopsy, a, a, a needle biopsy, um, uh, you can do computational work on the neoantigens that might attract these T cells. Um, so you, from these T cells, you identify which ones actually recognize these antigens, and that is an analytical chemistry challenge. It's very, very challenging. I'll, I'll talk about that. And then you match the T cell receptor alpha beta genes with the neoantigen MHC complex to this is like one of the fundamental immunology grand challenges. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, separate out the, um, from the healthy patient, you separate out CD8 and CD4 T cells. You edit out the endogenous T cell receptors and the MHC molecules. And this actually makes this sort of an off-the-shelf cell product. You edit in, to, um, and so editing in, because CRISPR is good at editing out, it is not so good at editing in. But I'll talk about the fact that actually you can do this with high efficiency. You edit in tumor reactive neoantigen T cell receptor. So this here, what constitutes, just knowing it's specific for a particular cancer antigen, doesn't tell you it's going to be tumor reactive. And this is a really fundamental chemistry problem that I'll talk about. And I think that we've uh, made a, a very significant breakthrough recently on. And then you expand these engineered T cells in vitro, and you want these to be great cancer cellers, killers. It's not obvious how best to do that. Um, and then you re infuse in the cancer patient. So this would go a long way towards taking that sort of one-off type therapy and making it into something that is a, a manageable process for, for many patients. Okay, so I'll refer to this a couple times in this talk. This is, the, uh, this is one of these, say, uh, 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 a tumor uh, neoantigens. This is the MHC molecule. It's, it's like a sort of a hot dog. I don't think you have hot dogs in Israel. I haven't for some reason, I haven't seen too many. Um, and, um, and, and an MHC, this is like, like the bun. 
And then, um, and this is the T cell receptor, which is pretty about as hard of a gene as there is to sequence because it's, it's just it's, it's two genes, alpha and beta gene, but they're different for every cell because of VDJ recombination. And um, and here's I'll just I'll come back to this as I go through um, the talk, but here's this paradox, okay, that I think is a really interesting one, and that has to do with the fact that the interaction of this T cell receptor with the peptide MHC is only about the strength of two hydrogen bonds. It's a pretty weak interaction. And yet it is really, really specific. And so that is not the kind of thing that one usually associates with uh, you think if weak interactions are not going to be that specific. This is one of these things that is actually very specific. And, um, and, and, it's, and I think the, the, the story of how you get the specificity is something that I'll, I'll come to in a little while. Okay, so let me talk about, but uh, just go through this list in order. So um, uh, identifying um, the candidate neoantigens, the T cells, um, and then matching the T cell receptor alpha beta genes with this, um, with the uh, antigen MHC, et cetera. Okay, so the first part, what are the candidate antigens? That's pretty straightforward. You just take the exome of the tumor, you identify the somatic mutations, you take the transcriptome, and you see what's expressed. You make a list computationally. You can do, uh, on, for many of these MHC molecules, each of us has probably got six different ones. Most of us don't have the same as everybody else, but, um, but for some of the more common HLA alleles that present these antigens, you can do reasonably good calculations, and you get a rank order list, so there is a mutation, this, this, uh, this red bit here, um, of, of, of how these antigens will bind to this MHC allele. So that's the binding constant in nanomolar. So for a particular HLA allele, for a particular patient, you get... Um, 500, um, up, to, up to 500 nanomolar, there's say 50 of these things. For six HLA alleles, one would get on the order of 300 of these, okay? And so if we go back to this initial patient I talked about, the, the breast cancer patient, that was unique to that patient. That therapy would not have worked on anybody else. That was the, so this is completely personalized medicine. This list will be unique to this patient. Okay, so T cells in the blood that are going to recognize these neoantigens are going to be there in pretty low numbers. And so this is just some, you know, from a milliliter of blood, um, just you can run through the math, but maybe five cells that see any particular neoantigen, unless you've got an activated immune response that's really working well, and you oftentimes don't have that. So the gold standard of how one does this um, is that you take this, um, this is the MHC allele presenting the, the uh, uh, neoantigen, that little brown thing there, and this, because it's such a weak interaction for the T cell, like a one micromolar type binding constant, you make a tetramer out of it with, with a, a streptavidin, and, um, and so um, a Tone Shoemaker's group developed this method. Here I take the exact same molecules, but I put one on a, on a red labeled uh, uh, streptavidin, one on a green one, and then I use them to label cells out of this uh, vial of blood, and ones that come up that are both green and red are, um, uh, are, 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 the, are the ones I want, okay? So how do you test the sensitivity of this method? You need a realistic sample. And so this is where um, this issue of how do you efficiently engineer a T cell receptor into cells, not just CRISPR added out one, but the CRISPR added in one comes into play. This is work that Alex Marzen is not, it's published on BioArchive, it's not a, a paper yet, but I can guarantee you it works, we've, we've, we've used it. Um, he's found that there's a particular CRISPR method with T cells, and probably because T cells are dividing, that you can get like about 30 to 50 percent transfection incorporation of, of the T cell receptor gene. So you knock out with high efficiency, but you knock in with, with pretty high efficiency as well. And so we call these um, Coquico cells. My students for a while thought these, that weren't on this project, thought these were cells that we were getting from Japan. They're not. It's knock out, knock in, knock out. Okay, so we, we, we prepare some cells like this. We just spike them into healthy um, blood, and you measure the sensitivity of this method, and we've got a 33% expression rate, and you detect roughly about half if you go to very, very, like single digit numbers, which is what we're going to have to be seeing for neoantigens, you see about, you know, half of these cells that you spiked in 
Um, and you can, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know it's a pretty reasonable R squared. If you look at the very low numbers, you know the R squared is obviously not as good. Um, but so that's not good enough. So we developed an alternative method, and all it does, it's, it's very simple, um, a very simple trick, is that instead of having a tetramer, you put the tetramer itself on the nanoparticle. So now this nanoparticle has 100,000 tetramers. So now you get really, really high avidity compared to just uh, uh, what you get from having a former. And then you use this, this magnetic nanoparticle, you precipitate out the T cells that recognize the, um, uh, uh, that, that, that you've uh, uh, captured um, using these, these, these tetramers onto the nanoparticles. And then um, and you, you see that they're live cells by live cell stain, and you just count them. Okay, so this is just a simple analysis here. And this, in fact, works um, spectacularly well. So here's the exact same sample, the exact same spiking in, and now we see 33, 33, these two numbers are the same, basically. So this basically captures all the cells that, that are there. This is sensitive enough now to see um, these populations from non-expanded blood. So to, to expand this capacity now, we take this, these, 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 these MHC molecules and this tetramer, we put them on the nanoparticle, but now the nanoparticles also have a DNA barcode. Um, and so the one DNA barcode here equals the uh, neoantigen identity here. Um, and so we pool all this stuff together, and then we search for the whole library of neoantigen-specific T cells using a single step here. So here's, so when you do this, you need to capture everything. So this is the, um, a live cell stain. This is uh, blood, uh, and neoantigen specific T cells that we're actually capturing. Oh, these are actually a, a viral antigen specific um, from a healthy patient. But the cells are being introduced here down the channel like this. Uh, the point being here that, that every single cell is captured. We're not missing a single one. And once they're uh, captured, one reads them out. And so here's this DNA barcode on the metal nanoparticle. And so if you, um, uh, you, you basically, this first position here happens to be red. It could be any one of these three colors. But you put in a read DNA. Um, this guy turns red. You displace it. It goes dark. And then you read the second position. Green displays, goes dark. Read the third position. Yellow, dark. And so here's a cell that was um, captured in red like this. Yellow, red, green. A yellow, red, green would be this particular. And so this list of 27 would correspond to that list of antigens that you calculate from the patient genome. And if you have four colors and four positions, that's 256. So this allows you to do a very large library pretty efficiently. And so when you do this kind of analysis, this is a, uh, we've done this on many patients now. This is actually the first uh, patient we did. This was, I would say, an easy patient because this patient was a melanoma patient that was responding to what's called checkpoint inhibitors. There were a lot of populations in the blood. But you don't need to have that response to see these cells. Um, you can have a patient that is just has a, a high tumor burden, and these numbers will be less, but you will see them. And so here, um, just to give you a history, this is a patient that had just pretty much failed everything, had a large tumor mass, and was started on a checkpoint. This is the, one of the very first checkpoint inhibitor therapy trials, only just a few years ago. And, um, and, and what you see, so we took the exome of the tumor from a biopsy here, therapy starts at day zero, and for the first you know, two or three months, the tumors actually grow. This is something called pseudoprogression that one sees with this kind of therapy. But after that period, they begin to melt away, um, and here, and basically, to this, this is just going to be a, a dead tumor mass. There's, not, there's nothing left here. This patient is still um, uh, fine today. And we took blood samples at these points, and we took another tumor biopsy at this, at this point here. So here's expression levels of, these, um, of the genes that, 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 that generate these neoantigen uh, fragments. Um, here's the um, uh, uh, an analysis of these neoantigens at these various time points. Here's the tumors here out at day 187. And I'll just point out that the same populations you see in the tumor, you see in the blood, by and large. Um, for These are the strongest bindings. And this is this list of 50 I showed you for that patient a while back. For the strongest binding ones, um, you actually need a fair amount of gene expression, uh, or I'm sorry, weakest binding ones. For the strongest binding ones, you don't need much gene expression um, to have a population here. Um, 
And, and in fact, right here at this early stage, you have the mo most robust anti-tumor response is just building up at this, during this stage. But there's um, many populations, they get uh, whittled down as you go over in time. So this allows you, this means that you can see these populations in the blood um, without having to amplify up the T cells or expand them or anything. Um, and it means that the blood actually provides a pretty compelling window for looking how this therapy progresses. Okay, so it turns out that any one of these populations, so let's say that this is a patient that, ha that we haven't treated yet, and we want to make a decision, and there's multiple ways you can do it, and, and you want to go for antigen, specific cells that recognize that particular neoantigen. That's going to be your therapeutic T cell. Well, the challenge is that when you look in the blood, those T cells are going to be polyclonal. By and large, every T cell is going to have a different T cell receptor. It's going to recognize the antigen, but it's not going to be the same T cell receptor. And so this is the technology now that we developed to take that same library approach, but match every T cell receptor gene, alpha beta gene, with the neoantigen. And so what you're looking at here is, this is just a filter process. These are all the nanoparticles that didn't find a T cell and here, just not very many T cells. These are in black because they've gotten these nanoparticles in them. But these are barcoded T cells that are, are just being filtered away from these nanoparticles to make the signal clean. And then if we go forward here, um, here's the, those are the filtered away nanoparticles. Here's the T cells. You can see them shooting down here. And, um, and then and, and that that's about right here at this point. And then in just a minute, and we have to be patient. Just keep, and you go down this little pathway, you keep, keep, <coughs> pop, and then they go into this drop seek platform. Um, so the, uh, I think um, many people are familiar with, with drop seek. It's, it's a, I would say it's a low fidelity variation of the type of approaches that Sonny just talked about for transcriptome analysis. Um, the trick here is that now on these nanoparticles, we have these tetramers to capture the T cell, but we also have to, inside the droplet, match the T cell receptor alpha beta genes to the neoantigen identity. And what that means is that you have to not only encode the neoantigen identity into uh, DNA oligomers that are on the nanoparticle surface, but you have to do the first 30 cycles or so of, of, RT, of PCR inside the little droplets. That's a hard thing to do, because little droplets don't like to withstand going up to 95 degrees centigrade. But you can do it. Um, it's a bit of a material science challenge, and, and you can do it with high yield. And so here we've taken a, um, it's a healthy patient. This is a tumor antigen that is just, um, many people will generate um, T cells that, that seed this tumor antigen. These are the alpha and beta chains. These are matched um, uh, cells that the indices match. And with about 85% yield, we can identify T cells that are specific to um, uh, uh, the antigen um, with both the alpha and the beta gene. Okay, so we, and, and, and because we have this barcode on here, we can do this in parallel. I'm not gonna show data on that, but it does work. You can actually do a library this way. Okay, so this is what you see. When you look at these, at these sequences, you see that you have there's one gene or, or one T cell receptor that you see on three cells, but by and large, it's completely polyclonal. Every cell has a different T cell receptor. And that's not surprising. In fact, I think that's expected. And so the challenge here is if you're going to pick, let's say this is the tumor antigen and you want the T cell that recognizes that antigen, which ones of these, which one do you pick? What's the therapeutic T cell? And, um, and so in other words, which of these T cell genes is gonna constitute an agonist T cell receptor neoantigen MHC interaction? And, uh, and this is, and TCR binding is not the full story. So this is gonna come back to this, this fundamental challenge of you have a, a weak binding interaction that tends to be very, very um, selective. And I wanna, I'm gonna spend some time talking about this. This is a problem that we um, you know, really got serious on working on about a year ago after we had a, a number of conversations with Chris Garcia uh, um, during a, a trip I took to Stanford. 
Um, and so let me just give you some background, because this is a problem that's been thought about for a long time. So people, there's a lot of papers that say it's the kinetics of the interaction. There's a lot of papers that say that, in fact, here's a really strong one that says CD8 T cell activation is governed by the affinity, not the dissociation rate. And here it's basically confinement time, dwell time, once again, affinity, kinetics. So there's this broad literature on this with no particular molecular mechanistic insight into what's going on here. And Chris had found some, um, had done some interesting observations. So he has this platform where he can, through, it's kind of a phage display platform where he can make um, a libraries of antigens, identify their binding affinity to T cell receptors in, uh, as, as antigen MHC complexes, and then do various physical measurements on them. And so what he found is that if you take this complex, this is the um, uh, uh, TCR, the antigens right here, this is the MHC molecule. If you put these on two, two cells and you basically pull on them, you expect that by and large it's gonna make these cells come apart. But it turns out that for certain of the T cell receptors, uh, peptide MHC interactions, you do it and it actually increases the lifetime of the interaction. And the picture in people's mind has been what's called a catch bond. And a catch bond is, um, the reason why it's called that is it's as if you have a fish hook that's embedded in something, and as you pull it apart, that fish hook catches. And so now you actually have a stronger interaction when you give that force, okay? And so here's three examples. This is a weak binder, but it's an agonist. So this one normally wouldn't be expected to, to activate the T cell, but it does, and you see this catch bond. Here's a strong binder and an agonist, and you see this catch bond as well. It's not quite as clear, but you see it. Here's a weak binder and a non-agonist. In fact, this one binds, I think, just a little bit stronger than this one, but it doesn't do anything. This is a, an, an HIV uh, 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 antigen a TCR, and you basically see um, no catch bond at all. And so, so to address this problem, um, I, I, had, I hired a postdoc, because I'm not very good at doing, um, but I thought with molecular dynamics we could address this, and so I hired postdoc Fan Lu, and then um, and, and got Bill Goddard, in fact, very heavily engaged, so we, we now um, have, 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 for the past year, met. When you, meet, when you were with Bill, you get to meet with him at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. That's basically the time that we meet. It's, it's a, it does wonders for the home life, you know. <laughs> I guess Mary's here, she can probably agree to that, yeah. Um, and, and, so, and so this is the, the, the scale of the calculation. So what we wanted to be able to do was see if we couldn't do a, 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 a simulation of the dissociation, identify what are these mechanical or these catch bonds, what is the basic nature of this, of this interaction. And so here's um, one of these catch bonds. And so just pay attention to one of these, these are salt bridges or hydrogen bonds, what have you just a kind of weak interaction, but we're dissociating the, the complex here, and, and just pay attention to what happens, and look. It switched from that partner to that partner, and if you looked at any one of these, you would have seen that happens. And so, what we found is that for these particular cash bonds, when you, you don't, you don't pull the thing, if you have a pencil, you don't pull at the lead and the eraser to break it. You, you, you bend it to snap it, you shear it. And so, in this case, if we shear along plus or minus x or plus or minus y, for any of these catch bonds, we will see, um, uh, we will actually see these catch bonds. And so, what you're looking at here, this is the bond that's formed in the, and what we estimate to be from our, our calculations, the equilibrium uh, 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 ground state of the structure. As you dissociate, this bond comes in and takes its place. And here's a, a similar case. Now you actually get two partners, uh, similar situation here, similar situation. So these are the four major interactions here that give you this uh, T cell receptor PMHC uh, binding, and all of them form these catch bonds. And here's the, this is, I think, a, a, 
a, a really interesting observation. So this is one that actually forms no cash bonds. You do exactly the same calculation, no cash bonds, just like in the experiment. There is no, um, and there's no agonist behavior here that's seen. The only difference between these two is this valine and isoleucine here. It's a single methyl group. And this single methyl group is enough to block, sterically block, these cash bond formations as this thing dissociates. So it's almost exactly T cell receptor, MHC, peptide, exactly the same system except for one methyl group. But it's enough to control everything. And this just shows now for these two um, uh, agonist, and this is the, the non-agonist, so you see this is always zero. So no matter how you dissociate it, you see catch bonds, but for the agonist ones, you, you, um, uh, uh, you, you continue to see them, but here you, ne you never, for HIV, you never see them. So I think this actually also goes a long way toward explaining the specificity of the T cell receptor of peptide MHC. Because it's not just a, a, a small number of weak interactions. It's basically a whole barcode encoded on this peptide MHC that interacts with the T cell no matter how you shift it. And so there's actually a whole bunch of interactions that are encoded there that lead to activation. And if you don't have those, um, you don't see that activation. So how am I, how am I doing? I don't know how I'm doing. Oh, I have 15 minutes. Well, I should just pull out another talk. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna talk about one last, um, one last issue here and then I'll, I'll try to sum up. So, so once you've identified, so we don't, I'll just go back here for a second and say, so we don't know how general this is. We have three cases and we started making some predictions that allow us to turn a non-agonist interaction to an agonist, and we're just beginning to test them, and it looks like we have some insight. Ultimately, one wants to have just a statistical model with the genetic information, and you can just predict it. We're not there yet, but I think we're probably about a year and a half away from being there, something like that. Um, but let's just assume that at least we have a line of sight on this problem right now, and that we can um, you know, get to the answer. And, um, and so then, once you identify that T cell receptor, um, you want to expand, you want to engineer it into the, into the uh, blood of the healthy patient, uh, make, after you make it an off-the-shelf type of, type of product, and then expand those, and then, you, uh, um, and then you put them back in the cancer patient. And you want to make sure that this uh, expansion in vitro um, is an effective is an effective approach. And this is, uh, it's not obvious how to do this. And if you look at, um, say, the CAR T cell literature, you'll find that um, you have a lot of you know, toxic effects, there's neurotoxicities that happen. You'll oftentimes have no response at all in the patients. Um, and so, so having good metrics for how you do this manufacturing is an important issue. And, uh, and the most effective metric, um, has come out of this measurement here, which um, was developed in my lab um, you know, uh, uh, seven years ago by, um, by Rong Fan and Chao Ma. And the basic idea here was to be able to look at the secretome of single T cells. That was the basic science approach. And to try to look at as a highly multiplexed analysis of as many of these secreted proteins as we possibly could from as many T cells as we possibly could at the same time. And so the, it's a microchip approach, and the, and the, the cells are, are basically, they don't produce very many proteins for, from a single cell, but if you put them in a very small volume, then um, that, those number of proteins can be a detectable level, and then you put a, a multiplexed um, a antibody array in that little volume, and now you have a way to do multiplex detection of these proteins from the cell. So this is one of these little volumes bounded by these two green alignment markers, in this case, we've measured the same proteins twice from the single cell. Um, this is just a small piece of one of these data sets. And so we, the, the first study we did with this on, on a patient sample was actually a, a cancer immunotherapy trial on an antigen-specific T cell engineered um, uh, 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 a trial with, with Tony Rebus. So basically a very early version of the, of the type of technology therapies I'm talking about here. Um, 
but some fundamentals are the same. And so on these patients, we looked at, from the blood, the CD8 and CD4 antigens every T cell populations. We looked at them over time, and we looked at them several patients. And if you took all the data from all the patients and all the time points and just clustered it, what you found is that the proteins themselves would cluster into groups that you could assign to specific biological functions, more or less. And all that meant is that there was some level of immune coordination in these T cells that was not, that was just universal across these patients. The second thing we noticed, and this is very important, is that the cells that produce the largest numbers of different proteins also for any given protein produce by far the most copy numbers. So in other words, if I have a cell that's producing five of different proteins, it's gonna be red colored here, or more, five or more, and then anything less is gonna be blue. But on this log scale, these polyfunctional cells are producing on a factor of 100 or more time, uh, 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 copies of protein than are the less polyfunctional cells. So that means that even though they're only 10% of the population, by an order of magnitude, they're dominating the, 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 the T cell immune response. They basically, they control everything. And so this suggested a very simple metric. So oftentimes you see highly dimensional data and you see it, you do dimensional data reduction, you see these Visney plots or whatever. This is just, a, this is just the simplest possible plot. It just says, you take the number of, of, of proteins that are being secreted by a, a given cell times the copy numbers of proteins from that cell and, 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 and sum them up over, you know, say, a, a thousand cells that you measure from this patient, and you get a polyfunctional strength index. And you measure that for different patients. And so we've used this now as a metric on a lots of trials. I'll talk about one of these. Um, and this is a trial that um, also was run out of the NIH by actually the um, um, same major fellow in the program, Steve Rosenberg. It was a trial of a, of a CAR T cell, but I could show you uh, similar data on, on several other types of immunotherapies. Um, and it was a non-Hodgkin's <laughs> lymphoma, about 22 patients. Um, these CAR T cells are, um, are basically uh, expanded up in vitro and then, and then put into these patients. And so um, here I'm showing the polyfunctional strength of the, of the CAR T cells um, from the strongest to the weakest. And on the bottom is the patient responses encoded as either green or red. And except for this one outlier, you do a terrific job here of separating the responders from the non-responders. And the uh, striking thing is that this is actually before the T cells even go into the patient. So normally, if you see a patient that doesn't respond, you want, to under, you want to go and study that patient. You look for what's going on. That's not the case here. It's just a manufacturing approach. And it says that the T cells, in fact, that the T cells that were infused here um, were probably not optimally manufactured compared to the T cells that were produced back here. Um, and furthermore, from the same analysis of pre-infusion products, we were able to identify that, um, that the polyfunctional cells that produced IL-17A protein um, were the ones, th those patients that had those cells were the ones that had the neurological adverse events. And so this analysis now be has become a standard analysis for T cell quality control. And there's not really any other analysis that we've done, and we've done a lot of them, that give you this type of informative an um, um, uh, feedback. And so that allows you now to, um, you know, as I've, let me just go back to probably this, this earliest approach. Um, so we think we have, uh, it's been engineered up beyond what, I, what I've talked about, but I just talked about the, the laboratory stuff. Um, identify T cells in the blood that recognize tumor associated neoantigens. That's done, it's now a pretty high throughput process, not in my lab, but, but through the company. The stuff that we do in my lab is still pretty low throughput. Um, we can now match for those new antigen specific T cells, the T cell receptor alpha beta genes. That doesn't tell you which ones are gonna be the agonist interactions, but we at least have a line of sight with this, um, with this catch bond hypothesis that we're working hard to validate that maybe 
we will be able to understand in some depth what constitutes an agonist interaction and be able to predict that just from the genetic information. Um, and then in terms of expanding the T cells in vitro, we also have pretty good quality control metrics and then um, uh, for doing this. And so, um, so where am I here? Okay. So I think, you know, if we, this is one of our goals now, can we, can we make this statistical algorithm to predict this agonist interaction? Um, preliminary results say that at least we have some insight. It's not an algorithm, but my postdoc fan says he can look at a, one, of these, one of these structures and anticipate if it's going to be a catch bond or not. I can't, but we have to, we're trying to code that up, um, and that'll, that'll take a little bit of time. Um, and, and, and a key part of this in terms of computational work, and I think we heard some talks on this yesterday, is that we have to really, from both an experimental and a uh, computational approach, just be able to do lots and lots of guesses to try to figure out and, and just lower the cost of bad guesses. And I think that's generic to, to many of these problems. Um, uh, and more generally, the immune system is full of B cells, T cells, and all these cells have an interaction specificity that is almost unique at the single cell level. Um, by far, the hardest of these are B cells. Um, I think CD8 T cells are the simplest. That's where we're making the most progress right now. Um, but I believe that somehow we will be able to eventually predict um, from uh, molecular analysis what these things recognize. <coughs> Um, if we know the spectrum of T-cell alpha-beta genes in an individual, can we identify disease-associated antigens, flu, Lyme, sepsis? Can we identify elite responders or people that will go to chronic disease? I think these are all sort of challenges that were science fiction a few years ago, but that people are now beginning to think of as, as legitimate um, problems that one can begin tackling. And I think all of those have the same combination of engineering, biology, and fundamental chemistry um, the challenges associated with them. And finally, as soon as we get a sunny day in Seattle, we'll take a picture of the group there, but, um, but this is a Caltech picture. Um, my son actually went into my closet and stole all my Hawaiian shirts, and my group wore them, and, um, but there were a few people that refused to wear Hawaiian shirts, and they're listed down here. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand that type of thinking, but it does happen. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes, Shimon. Jim, you mentioned... Uh, 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 oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Jim, yes, uh, for showing us the role of uh, chemistry in these important questions. And now, yes, your turn. Jimmy, you, me you mentioned a $7 million try per single patient uh, in the Rosenberg trial. Uh, with all this automation, have you ever done a cost analysis? How much will it cost to treat a patient? So, um, my feeling is that the cost can get down to about, in terms of cost of goods, to about $35,000, something like that. <coughs> Um, so let me describe the various advances that lead to that. So one is that a lot of this stuff becomes automated. Um, two is that, I didn't go into it, but a lot of the chemistries here for, for detecting these antigen-specific T-cell populations are very inefficient chemistries. And that's a problem that's been solved through a, a biological method now. No limitation on library size, no limitation on HLA allele, which was a major limitation of the methods I showed you. When you wanted to do an adoptive cell therapy on a patient, you basically had to have a clean room, GMP facility, for that patient to prepare that sample. Very labor intensive. But over the past few years, Meltini and a couple of other companies have actually reduced that to an automated console that's about the size of maybe an HPLC or something like that. And each automated console is its own GMP facility, and you can put many of those into that same room that you we're using to treat just uh, one or two patients. The idea of being, and we won't try this in our first trial, our first trial will be coming up here in about eight months. The idea of taking an off-the-shelf cell where you've knocked out the HLA alleles, which seems to be a, a good strategy, uh, I think that will dramatically lower the cost. That's not something that 
is, is, will be done in the next uh, year or so, but it'll be done within the next three years. So all of these things together, I mean, this was, a lot of the, these technologies were, were completely science fiction until Kite and Juno came along and did a lot of investment. And so we're riding on the backs of those, of, of a lot of those companies in, in terms of that, those types of investments and, and things they've made in making cell-based therapies. All we're doing is personalizing it here. It's a big step, but it's a, it, 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 it builds on a lot of what's been done over the past um, decade. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, we have learned from experience that it's, in these things, it's very hard to predict how fast the expenses go down. And of course, uh, the genome is, is an excellent example, how, yeah. it, how it dropped from tens of uh, million dollars to $1,000 or even less. So I think companies will still charge a lot of money for this. Sure. I hope not. Yeah. But they, but they, they will still, it, it won't be a cheap therapy for quite some time. Good. Yes, please. I'd like to ask a molecular dynamics question. So I was really intrigued by these catch bonds. And I wondered if there's any merit in a sort of taking a more dynamical perspective in the following sense. I'd like to make an analogy with the old story of the waiter and the tablecloth. So I can set a table, and I want to remove the tablecloth. And if I do it really quickly, then the table remains set. If I do it very slowly, all the dishes end up on the floor. So same tablecloth, same dishes, but it matters whether I do it quickly or slowly. Is there any merit in thinking about the way catch bonds operate in this way? I don't know. That's a good question. So typically, I would guess that the, you're not going to have really fast motions, at least not beyond what you might anticipate, because these are two cells that are together. The masses are pretty large. And when I talked about these applied forces that cause these cash bonds, these bonds to live longer and these cash bonds to form, those are basically forces that are within thermal motion of these systems. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know. I can't tell you if it's relevant or not. That's a, I, I don't know.